This is lecture 13 in BBSP 610. We'll be discussing hypothesis testing. As you'll recall from the last few lectures, inference is when you use sample data, some subset of a general population, to try to draw conclusions about a general population. That you want to draw conclusions about the average height of males in the United States, so you take a, a sample of 100 males, look at their average height, something like that. In some of the earlier lectures, we used information about the population parameter mu to extract information about a sample mean x bar. In practice, what you are more likely to do is you will collect the sample mean x bar, use that to draw inferences about the population mean mu. Oh, as you'll recall the birth weights example from the previous lecture, let's say that in a particular hospital the birth weights of newborn have a mean of 112, a mean weight of 112 ounces and a standard deviation of 20.6 ounces. And in the last lecture, we discussed how you could use this information to calculate the probability that a random sample of 10 babies has an average weight of greater than 126 ounces. That by the central limit theorem, if you take the average weight of 10 babies, that should be approximately normally distributed with mean 112 and standard deviation 20.6 divided by the square root of 10. So in other words, if we take 126 minus 112 divided by 20.6 over the square root of 10, that should be approximately normally distributed with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. You can compute it in R with the command I've listed below. It turns out to be about 0.0158. Now we'll briefly discuss hypothesis testing that say that we believe that the average weight, birth weight in our hospital is 112 ounces, but we don't know for sure. And in hypothesis testing terms, we could say we wish to test the hypothesis that the population average is 112 ounces. And to test that hypothesis, we collect a sample of 10 babies and we may pose the question, What's the probability that we have that if the true mean is 112 ounces, what's the probability that a random sample of 10 babies will have an average weight of 126 or greater? So some terminology for this problem. The null hypothesis is that the mean weight is 112 ounces. Generally speaking, your null hypothesis is something of a straw man. It's something that you're hoping to prove is false in your experiment. The alternative hypothesis is that your null hypothesis is false. In this case, the alternative hypothesis is that mean weight is greater than 112 ounces. And in this case, the test statistic for this null hypothesis would be calculated by taking 126 minus 112 divided by 20.6 over a square root of 10 as we discussed earlier and you can use that to compute a p-value which is the probability of observing a test statistic of 2.15 or greater. As I said before the null hypothesis is usually that your experiment failed that there's no difference between the two groups of interest or something like that. So, in this particular example, the null hypothesis is that the mean uh, the mean weight of these babies is 112 ounces. You could also have a null hypothesis that the mean weight gain is the result of a certain treatment is zero versus the alternative that it results in weight loss. Or you could say that the mean levels of cholesterol are the same between the treatment group and the, and the placebo group for some new cholesterol drug, something like that. The alternative hypothesis is that your null is false, usually means that the experiment was successful and you proved some association between the two groups.
The p-value is defined to be the probability of getting a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than what you observe, given that the null hypothesis is true. That if the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability that you would observe a weight of 126 or higher among a sample with 10 babies? And the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence again it's the null hypothesis. So to perform hypothesis testing, you first decide what your null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis should be. You assume that your null hypothesis is true, and then you collect evidence. Find the sample mean x bar based on a sample of 10 babies. Conduct your experiment, whatever that may be. Then you compute the test statistic. And all under the assumption the null hypothesis is true, and compute the probability of getting a test statistic as extreme or more extreme as the test statistic that you got, and that's defined to be your p-value. And if your p-value is sufficiently small, then you reject the null hypothesis. And there's two possible ways that you can go wrong under this paradigm. One is type 1 error, which means you reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. The other possibility is type 2 error, which means we fail to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. Usually type 1 error is considered to be more serious. If you reject your null hypothesis when your null hypothesis is true, that means that you publish a false result and add false information to the body of scientific knowledge. Whereas if you fail to reject your null when the null's false, then maybe that just means that you need to collect more data, things like that. So the usual paradigm is that you force the probability of type 1 error to be low and then try to minimize the probability of type 2 error. And if the p-value is as small or smaller than some value alpha, then we say that the data or the test is significant, statistically significant at level alpha. In practice, you almost always use alpha equals 0.05. In other words, if your p-value is less than 0.05, you reject your null hypothesis. If it's not, then you fail to reject. In my opinion, I mean, it's a decent rule of thumb, but it's become just almost a matter of religious dogma among journals and journal reviewers and so forth. I think the cutoff, I think that people get so obsessed with P equals 0.05 that it leads to a number of scientific problems, but that's kind of the industry standard right now, so it's probably what we'll use for most of this class. In the birth weight example, we got a p-value of 0.016, as you'll recall, so it would be statistically significant at the alpha equals 0.05 level, but not at the 0.01 level. And just to kind of illustrate why, this is, why I think this paradigm is problematic, that you can imagine one experiment gives you a p-value of 0.049, another experiment gives you a p-value of 0.051. Well, these are almost certainly within the margin of error of one another, but scientific dogma has that the first result means that there is a true difference and we can reject the null hypothesis for this experiment, whereas the latter one means that we can't, which to me is a little bit crazy. In general, I advocate just reporting the p-values and the confidence intervals in order to give your readers some idea of what the true strength of the association is, that rather than getting hung up on this significant versus not significant dichotomy. So, Another example of hypothesis testing, Valerie Soldato's urea data we discussed it previously, we discussed a bit in the previous lecture. Say we want to test the hypothesis that the mean urea excreted is 30 milligrams per deciliter. So in this case, the null hypothesis would be that the mean is 30. The alternative hypothesis would be that it's not equal to 30. And if you recall from the previous lecture that for a sample of size 30, 
if you take the sample mean minus 30 divided by the sample standard deviation over the square root of sample size, that should be a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So this picture illustrates when we would reject the null hypothesis. Under the null hypothesis, we would expect the distribution of the quantity of urea to be a bell curve shaped at 30. So if we see something that's below about 28 or above about 32, the probability of that happening under the null hypothesis is very low. So in that case, we would reject the null hypothesis. Oh, one way that you can do a SNR is with the following command. This is more complicated than it needs to be, but if you ever needed to calculate it this way, what I do here is, first of all, I calculate the probability of being in the lower tail of the distribution in, well, actually the upper tail. The, in this case, I know that the mean is greater than 30, so the mean, the sample mean minus 30 divided by the standard error to get the area to get the area in the rightmost tail, I take 1 minus that because if I go to the left of that, because we want the right tail, and then we multiply it by 2 since the distribution is symmetric. So we get the total area in both tails. In this case, it turns out to be about 9.7 times 10 to the minus 6. Very strong evidence against the null hypothesis that the true mean is 30. In practice, you'll probably want to do this using the t.test command, because then you don't have to do the funky stuff that I did on the previous slide. Say t.test urea, and with the alternative, with the null hypothesis that mu is equal to 30, see we get the same p-value that we got on the previous slide. And in general, if you say t dot test x comma mu equals mu zero, that will test the null hypothesis that the mean of x is equal to mu zero. If you don't include the parameter mu, then it's assumed to be zero. And you don't have to specify mu if you're using t dot test just to compute a confidence interval, because in that case, you're not doing a hypothesis test. All you want is the values of the confidence interval. They'll be the same for any value of mu zero. So let's say we wish to test the hypothesis that the mean concentration is no more than 32 milligrams per deciliter. This case would be doing a one-sided hypothesis test, would be testing the null hypothesis the mean is less than or equal to 32 versus the alternative that is greater than 32. So in this case, the rejection region would be the red region in this graph, that if the sample mean is too large, then we would reject the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis is less than or equal to 32, but if we end up with a sample mean that's less than 32, then we definitely fail to reject in that case. Because if it's less than or equal to 32, we're perfectly happy. We only want to reject if it's greater than or equal to 32. So again, you can do this using either PT or T.test. T.test is probably easier. Note the new parameter in this case. It's the same syntax as for, but I say alternative equals greater and that will give you a one-sided test. You'll notice in the line before that I didn't multiply by 2 because I only want the probability in the upper tail this time. I don't want to reject the null hypothesis if the test statistics in the lower tail. So in general in R, if you do t dot test mu equals mu zero and then say alternative equals greater or alternative equals less, that will test the null hypothesis that the mean is mu zero against the alternative that it's greater than mu zero or less than mu zero. And you can also say alternative equals two dot sided, but that's the default in R. So if you don't specify the alternative, it's assumed to be two sided. So in general, you don't need to actually type that.
In practice, almost everyone uses two-sided tests because they're more conservative, they're the default for most statistical programs, and a surprising number of scientific journals say explicitly that you have to do two-sided tests for everything. In, and in general, my personal preference is to always do two-sided tests just so you avoid the headache of having to justify why you didn't. If your sample size is small and you need some additional power to get a significant result so that you can publish it, which, let's be honest, happens sometime, you can do one-sided tests, but be prepared to defend the decision because it'll make a lot of journal reviewers suspicious. But if you're doing st statistics correctly, you have to make the decision to use a one-sided test in advance. That, for example, say one instance where I wanted to use a one-sided test and got slapped ja down by a journal reviewer was I had developed a genetic risk score to predict the risk for a certain type of leukemia. The hypothesis was that the greater the score, the greater the risk of leukemia. If I had found a significant association in the other direction that a greater score was associated with lower risk, I wouldn't want to publish that because that implies that my risk index had failed. So in that case, it would be justifiable. What's not justifiable is that you just want to publish a paper and your p-value using the two-sided test which is barely short of significance. I'm like, well, I'm going to change my null hypothesis and make it one-sided, and then my findings are significant. That's cheating. You'll get spurious results if you take that approach. So, also thought it was worth mentioning that there's a relationship between hypothesis tests and confidence intervals that, in general, a test is statistically significant at alpha equals 0.05 if and only if mu zero is outside the 95% confidence interval, and it's not significant if and only if mu zero is within the 95% confidence interval. In other words, if the hypothesized mean is inside the 95% confidence interval, you fail to reject. But if it's outside the 95% confidence interval, then you reject. For example, let's look at the urea data again. That, say, we want to test the null hypothesis that the true mean is 33. If I do the t dot test with the default 95%, confidence level, I get a confidence interval that goes from 33.2 to about 37.1. Note that that interval does not contain 33, so my p-value my p -value is 0.03. I would reject at the p equals 0.05 level. However, if I calculate a 99% confidence interval, then that 99% interval goes from 32.5 to 37.7. And in this case, 33 is contained in the interval, so we would fail to reject at alpha equals 0.01, which again is consistent with what we see here. We would reject at alpha equals 0.05 with a p-value of 0.03. We would not reject at alpha equals 0.01. A couple things to keep in mind with hypothesis testing. First is the question of statistical significance versus practical significance. A result is statistically significant if it's not likely to be the result of chance. And this depends very heavily on n, that if your sample size is small, then you need a really substantial difference to be confident that the result isn't due to chance. But if you have a large sample size, then even very small differences that probably have very little real-world importance will still be statistically significant. So, hypothetical example on cholesterol drugs. Let's say that two drugs were compared to a placebo, and in one study of 5,000 patients, the drug, drug one lowered LDL cholesterol by one point compared to placebo, whereas in a study of 50 patients, drug two lowered LDL by 25 points. 
And in this case, it's quite possible that drug 1 will be significantly better than a placebo and drug 2 won't be. But that doesn't mean that drug 1 is a better drug. It may just be that we didn't have a big enough sample size to see that drug 2 is more effective. This is why I say you should report p-values and confidence intervals rather than just saying a result is or is not significant. If you have a confidence interval that doesn't include zero but is very close to zero, that indicates that there may be some effect, but it isn't a very important one. And one concept that you've probably encountered before, I've mentioned it a few times thus far, is this idea of power. And the power of a statistical test is defined to be the probability of rejecting the test or rejecting the null hypothesis given that the null hypothesis is false. In other words, if the if your cholesterol drug really is more effective than the placebo, the power is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis of no difference between the drugs. So high power implies that you're more likely to detect a truly significant result. And if your sample size is too small, then your test may have insufficient power, and funding agencies will often ask you to demonstrate that your proposed study will have sufficient power to test your hypothesis. I, th these days, it's relative, you, it's not too difficult to do simple power calculations using R. I won't get into it in this class, just in the interest of not packing too much stuff into a 10-week class, but I'm happy to discuss this with you if you're curious about it or need to use it or need to do that for whatever reason. So some comments about st significance thresholds is, like I said, the industry standard in science is you reject your null hypothesis if your p-value is less than 0.05. But if you're trying to overturn a widely accepted hypothesis or you have a kind of a strange or unexpected finding, you may want to be more conservative than that. I mean, in practice, this doesn't happen as much, nearly as much as it should. People usually want to publish papers because it helps their career. If you get an unexpected finding, you can get it into a high-profile journal. So people like to publish their unexpected findings, but... If your p-value is just slightly less than 0.05, there is a decent chance that it's a fluke. There have been several recent studies on reproducibility of science, and a lot of them have been kind of disturbing with the number of experiments that could not be reproduced. But one of the strong predictors they found of whether a p an experiment could be reproduced was just the size of the p-value. If you had a p-value of like 10 to the minus 5, it was much more likely to be reproducible than an experiment with a p-value of 0.04, for example. And this problem is especially relevant if you're testing multiple hypotheses that if you use p less than 0.05 as your significance threshold, about 5% of the time you're going to reject your null hypothesis even when it's true. And if you're, doing, if you're testing multiple hypotheses, this can be a major problem. I gave this example once earlier in the course, but it was a famous example where a group of researchers gave a psychological questionnaire with 100 questions to schizophrenia patients and mass controls, found that four of the questions on the survey, the responses were significantly different between cases and controls at the P less than 0.05 level. They ran out and published these findings. What's the problem with this? Well, hopefully you see it already. When, if you use p less than 0.05, about 5% of the data will be, or about 5% of the time, you'll reject your null hypothesis even though it's true. So if you do 100 tests, you'll expect to reject about 5 of the tests by chance. So if they rejected 4 of them, that's about what you would expect to see by chance. So when you test multiple hypotheses, the probability of making at least one type 1 error is significantly greater than 0.05. And for those of us doing modern high-throughput genomics, this is a major issue. If you ever look at microarrays or GWAS or things like that, the probability you're 
doing thousands, in some cases millions of hypotheses, the probability of at least one false positive becomes extremely high. And there's ways that you can deal with this to minimize your loss of power while adjusting for multiple corrections. I won't be able to get into them in this class, but for the time being, know that if you're performing multiple hypothesis tests, the P less than 0.05 threshold may be too liberal. And some other caveats about hypothesis testing, these were the same caveats that we talked previously about in terms of confidence intervals. The results of hypothesis tests are only valid if your sample is representative of the population as a whole. If you have a biased sample, you're dead in the water. Increasing your sample size won't help you. All your observations have to be independent. And for a small sample size, the data has to be approximately normally distributed. And in particular, outliers can cause major problems with this. So let's take the urea data and say and create a hypothetical version where say they forgot to key in the decimal point for the first value in the data set so rather than 31.29 they coded in 3129 well now if we do the t dot test on this modified data set we fail to reject the null hypothesis uh, that it's different from 30 and if you look at our confidence interval, it's now huge just because the one outlier drastically increased our standard deviation and caused us to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So even a single spurious observation can reduce the power of your test or cause you to falsely reject your null hypothesis. For better or for worse, it usually tends to reduce the power of your test because the standard deviation will increase more than the mean will, but you can find examples, particularly when you do regression, where a single outlier can give you a spurious false positive as well. So before you do any type of hypothesis testing, you want to do some careful data cleaning, check your data for outliers. This is another reason to report confidence intervals along with p-values. If you see ridiculously huge confidence intervals like we saw on the previous slide, that's an indication that something might be wrong. So the things to remember from today's lecture is that a one sample t-test can be used to test the hypothesis the mean of the data set is equal to a certain value. By convention, a test is significant if the p-value is less than 0.05. You want to be careful with this and not apply it mindlessly. And there's a relationship between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. A uh, test is significant if and only if the hypothesized value of the mean is contained in the 95% confidence interval or the confidence interval of the appropriate level. And for this reason, well, for a variety of reasons, it's a good idea to report confidence intervals along with the test results and p-values. Just because the test is statistically significant doesn't mean that the differences you observe have practical importance, and you need to be especially careful when you perform multiple hypothesis tests. And here's some examples of R commands. If you say t.test and specify a given value of mu0, it'll test the null hypothesis the mean of your data is equal to that value. And you can also specify an alternative hypothesis that's either greater or less than the hypothesized value.